Okay. So, uh, hello everyone, welcome. My name is Leah Wolf. I'm the head of regenerative ed education and content here at HowGood um, and welcome to the uh, HowGood Innovation Online Series. We've been hosting these conversations with thought leaders for a little over a year now, talking about everything from biodiversity to labor conditions to soil health and beyond. Uh, this series is focused on regenerative supply and specifically how we can scale up products and innovate in a way that doesn't compromise the integrity and transparency of our regenerative goals and ideals. Uh, today, I'm really excited to be speaking with two pioneers in sustainable packaging to discuss innovative packaging design for regenerative products. Um, so we have with us today Jay Ashworth, who's the co-owner and director of sustainability at Associated Labels and Packaging. And we have Kelly Williams, who is a sustainability strategist, strategist for Futamura. Um, just to give you a little bit of an idea of our agenda for today, we will have a panel discussion for 30 to 35 minutes, a community discussion in breakout rooms, um, and then we will have our Q&A at the end where we'll have the opportunity to ask uh, any questions of our speakers that we hadn't gotten to yet. Um, we have some upcoming events. Um, this one in particular, we're really excited about scaling regenerative agriculture. We're going to be speaking with Ganesh Bandal and Ryan Ciroli, both from Cargill. Um, we're going to be talking about strategies and insights from the world's largest and oldest agribusiness. Uh, topics will include supply system investments, impact measuring and communication, the potential of regenerative agriculture for farmers and for the climate. So that is not to be missed. Um, and we'll be holding that on October 14th, so next Thursday at 1 p.m. So I hope to see you there. Um, and without further ado, we will get started. Okay. So thank you, Kelly and Jay, so much for being with us today. I'm really excited to be talking with you about regenerative packaging, um, something that I think people have been maybe not giving enough thought to, uh, but is definitely becoming much more a part of the conversation um, in the in recent years. Um, and so I usually like to start out by uh, asking that we all do something called intro by the numbers. Um, this is something that Ethan, our CIO likes to do. And I think it works really well to kind of get, um, get everyone acquainted and to learn a little bit more about your roles in your business without kind of going through a more a uh, lengthy and traditional introduction. Um, and so usually we'll start out, I, I can start out. Um, so the number that I'll choose is 33,000, which is the number of ingredients, chemicals, and products that are in our Lattice, our sustainability database. Um, and so Jay and Kelly, if you have a number in mind that either represents your business or something that you're excited about in regenerative packaging, I'd love to hear a little bit about that and the way it ties into your role and your company. Who wants to go first? <laughs> I think you just volunteered, Kelly. Right. So I thought of two, but I'll, I'll start with um, one of the problems we have in, in packaging, which is you can't support 7.8 billion people without packaged consumer goods. Otherwise, we have to become overnight homesteaders. So it's a necessity, but it has to be done differently. And of that, there's roughly one to two million combinations of materials used today in packaging. Well said. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for us, um, I think a little philosophical here, we have seven regenerative principles that we're trying to follow uh, for the past two years. And one of them is really looking at uh, systems change. And that's really where I think the focus is for our stance as a company and packaging. Um, yeah. Great, thank you so much. I think that's a perfect transition into a question that I'd like to ask both of you, which is, what does regenerative packaging mean to you, mean to your company? And what is the difference between regenerative and sustainable packaging uh, in your opinion? Or is there one? I'll go first. <laughs> Great. Um, before I, I give that, the answer to that question, let me first say that circularity and sustainability might be in the running for the most misused and misunderstood terms of the modern era. Uh, it's like telling someone to stop being facetious when you really don't know what the word means, but you kind of know. Uh, so to me, sustainability means you can do it forever. 
And that's one of the challenges that we have. Can you do this forever? So sustainability doesn't mean sustaining what you've always done. It means sustainability, meaning you can do it forever. Regenerative to me is just a more appropriate way to say organic recycling, where packaging materials are made from nature's already optimized polymers, use them for a temporary purpose and they return to the soil to regenerate new plant growth. So regenerative means it starts from nature and it returns to nature. Fantastic. Jay? Yeah. For, oh gosh, this was very interesting. It's, it's very uh, it's obscured and blurred and yeah, this, this term sustainability have kind of lost their meaning for me, even though my, my role has the name in it. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I, I see sustainable packaging or the word sustainable as very much um, trying to like measure, uh, a lot of measure, a lot of qualitative measurements, trying to fix problems around, you know, how we can do better or do less damage that way. Um, in terms of like sustainability, in terms of packaging, I don't know if we'll ever be able to sustain packaging if we're a human population is continuously growing. That's just, that does, doesn't work. Um, for me, regenerative packaging is more, you know, holistic thinking, systems thinking, um, it, and it's more about qualitative measurements, which I feel like aren't usually um, front and forward for most companies. And there's many reasons for that. One being that you can't really show, you know, profit against qualitative. I'm sure you can, but it's just it's a it's a hard paradigm for people to think around. Um, and then for me, I was really struggling with packaging and it being regenerative because I was like, well, how can a package regenerate itself? It's not gonna regrow itself or, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, a thing, right? So, but I did, I was thinking more around, um, you know, like things that are around the package that we can start to deal with more. It's, it's, it's about a different lens, I think, um, looking at packaging and, and, and again, the whole kind of system around that, not just your package, but, you know, where that's being impacted, maybe in ecosystems or, communities, how that package is actually impacting people. So, um, because a lot of the technology is already out there in terms of compostable or, um, you know, recyclable or, or renewable resources for that. So, yeah. Certainly. Yeah. And I think that that touches on a bit of the way that how good thinks about, and certainly the way that I think about regenerative, um, in that it's not just doing the same thing. It's not doing less bad it's doing more good, not only for the environment, but also for the people that use the product, for the communities that produce them, and then are also for the communities where that packaging might end up uh, once it's been used. And so I'd like to maybe try to keep that in mind as we're going forward. What are the ways that packaging can regenerate both the environment and communities and people? Um, and so that being said, if you had a billion dollars to invest in a product, in a uh, packaging innovation, something that um, doesn't exist yet, that just doesn't have the funding, doesn't have the hype, I guess, um, but you think is really exciting and could have that regenerative potential. Um, is there anything that comes to mind and, and how would you spend your billion dollars? Uh I think we're already seeing signs of that now. Um, <clears throat> if you've ever heard the term distributed manufacturing, we're already seeing that. I think COVID and the pandemic it is teaching brands that where they went offshore for costs, they're starting to bring supply chains back closer. And if you took all the ants in the world and all the humans in the world, it's roughly the same, 350 million tons. But, and even though they eat 30 times their body weight and in food intake, we take in 3%. The difference between us and ants is they have a net ecological um, benefit. We have a net ecological demand. So if we wanna live like ants, we can't be shipping stuff all over continents. So you have to think locally. So biomass is, is available everywhere. The average harvest in, index, which is how much food is actually taken from the plant is somewhere between 48 and 49%. The rest of that has to find a home. So that's a great source of raw material that the planet has already optimized, the polymers, the chemicals that we can use to make these packaging needs, but do it in a local level. So if, if, if it were my billion dollars, I see the need to start taking that biomass 
extracting the cellulose in a greener way so we can use it to make packaging, not shipping it from Thailand to the United States, but making it in Ohio, in California, because paper is the, one of the original um, packaging materials. It's a canvas that you can paint green chemistry on to do the different things. And then the biopolymers then complement all of those combinations. So to me, I would invest in green pulping technology because that we're going to have to have it. We can't continue to rely on paper from craft mills. The solution to pollution can't continue to be dilution. Well said. And I'm curious, um, what, what are some of the main sources of that biomass that you're envisioning? Is it something that is a byproduct of an agricultural industry, or is it something that is going to need to be produced specifically both. for? Okay. Both. both. Agricultural biomass is plenty, plentiful. Um, if you look at, um, you know, rice, oats, wheat, all of that, there's a tons of biomass. In some areas, they burn it because they don't know what else to do with it. But you can also grow grasses easier and faster than you can grow trees that generally have more cellulose than trees. The reason we use trees to make paper is because when you have to have a process that does 1,500 tons a day to amortize the sins of the process, it's hard to bring in 1,500 tons of bales of wheat straw. Just imagine the enormity of the space you would have to hold bales of wheat straw. Logs become a convenient way to move it, but now you have this densely packed cellulose you have to then unravel. So it's like a double-edged sword. It creates why that process is 93% of the world's pulp manufacturing. To me, hemp is a very, very important raw material. It's a great material. It's a, it's a biorefinery in, in and of itself, but all the agricultural waste as well. So there, there's great sources of the cellulose and the lignans and the chemicals to synthesize new biopolymers. It's all there. We just have to realize that when we develop the platforms we live on today, that was during a time when the question was, can we do it? Today, the appropriate question is, should we do it? And in order to do something new, you got to stop doing something old. So we're kind of caught in that inflection point. Sure. Yeah. And using the, doesn't wor work to use the same tools that created the problem to fix the problem. Um, Jay, if you had that same billion dollars, uh, would you do something different with it? Yeah. Um, I do agree on the local aspect for sure. In terms of finding kind of local solutions for each you know, city or county or because um, I see a lot of the kind of, you know, ways to the solutions are always very general based and, and they don't really work and they don't work for scale. There's lots of great ideas out there for, for instance, um, there's carbon negative like inks you can get now, but it's that might only be that might only make sense for a certain area. Like, again, you don't want to be shipping that, you know, across the world because then it just loses all the viability of that system. Um, so, yeah, and I think so investing in something in something that's local because then you can also attach your company or yourself to that ecosystem or that community. So if the inputs are coming from somewhere local, you can actually make an impact. But right now, a lot of packaging, we don't know where any of those inputs are coming from. Uh, and that's, that's concerning for many reasons. Um, so yeah, it would have to be something that's kind of locally sourced, a local solution, um, and obviously something that's renewable. So yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. There's already lots out there. It's just, I think, finding one specific to an area. It's kind of like using what you're good at. Um, you know, up here in the Pacific Northwest, we don't have bricks, brick buildings. We have a lot of wood buildings because that makes sense. So it, it's got to be something like that, something that makes sense to where you are located. But that's also very hard because our products get shipped all over the world or all over North America. So it's just, yeah, it's very difficult. <laughs> Totally. It's a huge, I mean, it's a gargantuan distribution issue, but it's also, I, the CPG industry is now at what, $3 trillion, I think I saw the other day. Um, and so the CPG industry, the demand for those packaged goods is not going anywhere. Um, as you said, we had a very different problem when we started uh trying to come up with packaging, packaging solutions in the 20th century. Um, and so moving away from non-regenerative packaging options like plastics, it can, it feels like a pretty overwhelming task. It's hard to even, the scale of it is like hard to even wrap your head around. Um, and you touched on this a little bit, Jay, 
how how are you tackling these problems of scale um, and the scale at which we'll need to produce regenerative alternatives? Um, is it just going to have to be many different smaller scale producers and solutions coming together, or is there a way that we can um, you know make make it work on a large scale more quickly? Yeah, I feel like it's kind of like that kind of like the same energy mix conversation. Like there's not gonna be one, again, one thing that solves it for everyone, <clears throat> but it's gonna be this energy mix, right? Like there's like maybe um, wave power, solar panel, wind power. Um, I, I feel like that that's kind of where it needs to come from. Um, yeah, I, and again, just whatever works for that company in that location, it's, yeah, it's, it's a, <laughs> It's a big one to try and figure out, but yeah, it's, it's a daunting task. Yeah, definitely. Kelly, do you have any thoughts on, on scaling regenerative? I think scale has to be rethought in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. So we think of scale, how cheaply can you make it at a large scale? And that's the problem with, with repurposing is I don't like to use the term recycling because a bag of chips is never going to become another bag of chips. It's going to become a dog Frisbee or a deck board. And so it's not circular, it's repurposing. And to, it's like if I took a handful of glitter and blew it all over everyone listening right now and, and asked you nicely, can you pick up all those pieces and bring them back to me? How much of that would I get back from the willingness of them to bring it back to me? That's the entropy that's in the current problem. So you don't solve entropy with more entropy. So when you think of scale, you gotta think small scale. You gotta be able to do things efficiently at a smaller scale. And I don't think the wiring is set yet to really understand that, that you have to make these materials. So if you took a map of the United States and looked at the population density by county, and then overlay that with where co-packers physically exist, no surprise, they exist where people live. So you should be making packaging where people live, not in some far off place where everything ships in truckload quantities of roll stock that have to get there a week late from when they need it in order to, to make it. So I think that that's some of the things we have to unravel uh, and unpack, but scale, I think the term scale, we need to rethink it. Sure. And I think, I mean, what you're describing sounds a lot like an infrastructure problem um, that we don't have the, the kind of, uh, facilities that we need on a more local or regional level in order to produce that local packaging. Um, do you have any thoughts on how we could get started making that happen? I, that's a big question. So I, I mean, if it's legislative or if it's, you know, companies committing to that type of um, infrastructure investment in their ESG strategies, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I, I think we have a perfect storm of opportunity because where there's confusion and panic, there's opportunity. So no matter how much legis leg legislative power uh, big oil has over, you know, like in my state of Ohio, they, one of the other states that banned the bans, no local municipalities allowed to ban anything, straws, bags, nothing. So that can only go on for so long. That's just a temporary stopgap to this overall I'd say continental movement that, that has to happen. And when that starts to happen, I believe we've already entered the, the next era, the eighth era in human history. It's called the new materials age because nature's already built everything that we need. We have just never had the incentive to understand it and to get at it. So I can create, not only do I not have to go search for an enzyme to take something that's like a cellulose change chain and do something to it, I don't have to go find one in nature. I can build one to do that. So when you combine these technologies, everything we need is right in front of us. It just, the, the, the clouds got to clear so we can see that path and believe in it. And then the innovation and the opportunity just kind of flow from it. Sure. And when it comes to innovation, when it comes to design, when it comes to research and development, what are some of the, what, what are the processes that happen within your roles and at your companies um, when you are designing a new product? Yeah, for our company, um, you know, a lot of our 
I guess, demands or questions come from trends from our customers. Um, and we take those and we have to vet them ourselves. And we also use a third party lab to kind of vet, you know, see if we're missing, we're missing anything as well. Right. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very important for that process to happen. Um, yeah. So Sorry, can you repeat the question? <laughs> the question? Sure, yeah. Well, so I'm just wondering what that design process is like, what the R&D process is like, but maybe also um, what are some of the obstacles that right. you typically face yeah, um, for and sure. what so, part of the process? Yeah, so the, the thing is um, we, can, we can take, and we've created many packaging, um, you know, compostable packages that, you know, we, we take it all the way to the fact that it's complete. Um, but there's just like, there's not much demand for it, which is very kind of disheartening. <laughs> um, so it's, it's very hard to, and, and that's why for my role, it's, it's actually switched to a, like a lot of the systems change because we have a lot of the technologies like Kelly's saying, like even currently we have, you know, tons of compostable packaging, um, but it's again, the systems aren't there to support it. So if the systems aren't there to support it, or there's no value um, after that package has been used, then um, you know, the system just doesn't work. We're, we're, our current packaging is attached to a, a waste system where it's just thrown in the garbage. Um, and we need to, to rethink uh, what this new regenerative system includes when we talk about packaging. Um, I, I remember even looking at the regenerative organic certification, but I didn't see anything about packaging. Um, and, and again, if we're talking about putting, you know, our beautiful organic <clears throat> fair trade products into um, petroleum-based packaging, does that work in a regenerative, you know, principles, right? So, and then, then again, it's like, well, then how does packaging fit into this regenerative agricultural system? If we're creating compostable packaging, can we make something that can turn into compost that can recreate the very products that were, that are part of that package? So for, for food tomorrow, it would be, maybe we can, we can use that compost material to, to recreate, you know, um, the the, the trees like that are growing from that to increase the soil if it's like a plantation or whatever it is or polyculture. Um, so for me, it's it, it always comes back to the system and the, the packaging stuff is kind of already there, but it's just there's, there's not much incentive for people. And uh, and then I think once people kind of find out how long it takes to get you know certification for compostable packaging and the cost and the timeline, it just completely undercuts that conversation. So we need. I think we truly need to start building <clears throat> the system that can support this um, and the mindset because it's it's going to be a while if we don't. <laughs> and we can't wait for government. Uh, that's just going to take way too long. The government's usually the ones who puts the cherry on the top and takes all the credit for it. So um, <laughs> it's going to come from industry for sure. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Jay. Um, an old farmer once told me, don't get wrapped around the wrong axle. So we tend to get so caught up in the infrastructure where when people ask me, well, what if it ends up in the landfill? The earth doesn't care. The earth doesn't care when it eats it so long as they can eat it. That's So worry about what escapes collection, not what gets collected. And if you, you can't scoop water out of a boat faster than water's filling into it, you gotta plug the hole first. So I talk in terms of earth digestible. If you make the packaging out of materials that are designed to be a food source for microorganisms at some point, that's the first step. Then you work on the infrastructure. But for brands in my role, what I, what I see as being one of the big obstacles is, and what's great is they most eight out of 10 understand what I'm about to say. They don't know what they need. They only know what they're currently getting because packaging is so severely over-engineered that we have created the Spanish Inquisition of R&D tests to separate one, over, one supplier's over-engineered packaging from another supplier's. There is no such thing as accelerated shelf life testing. Sticking it into an oven at 90% relative humidity mm -hmm. for four weeks or eight weeks is not accelerated shelf life. Accelerated shelf life is putting it into the market and examining how it performs. That's one obstacle. The other is we've become so accustomed to the benefits of, of the shelf life that you know people say, I want at least two years, ideally three years. Well, guess what? You can't remember who won the Super Bowl three years ago. Are you gonna eat a bag of chips that was made three years ago? No, so you have to let go of that and realize that those supply chains are not going to support that type of because these are materials designed to become a food source for microorganisms. You can't design them. You can't, 
have your cake and eat it too, but brands truly can today get packaging that lets them have their cake and the earth can eat it too. They just have to rethink it a little bit. And part of that is rethinking the way the packaging is made, but also realizing that packaging is not a cost center. It never has been a cost center. You can't sell a, pa a, a package consumer good without a package. So why would you ever consider it a cost center? It is a profit center. It is the, the billboard for which your product is contained in. And that billboard space combining digital technology and other things, you can create one-to-one -one relationship with the consumer that bought it. You can use it to, to bring truth to power. So if you really want to help the composters, hey, let's put 50 million bar wraps in California and say, we want you legislators to, to uh, subsidize composters to take packaging. Because the problem they have isn't that they don't want to take packaging, it's that they don't screen stuff on the front end like material recovery facilities do. They screen it on the back end. So if they run between two and 5% material that doesn't break down, they can't afford for that to instantly go to 10 to 15%. But if they were subsidized like other industries are subsidized, perhaps they can make that investment to manage that more effectively. You can change that like that with the power of packaging. Packaging is a physical form of social media that's yet to be untapped. Um, I think that ties in really well, uh, twofold. One, there's a great question in the comments um, uh, that asks about what kind of advice you'd give to a corporate decision maker who is interested in moving toward regenerative packaging um, and how to select the most regenerative packaging um, and what are the most important concepts to walk away with for these decisions. And I think that you've touched on it quite a bit, Kelly. Um, if you have anything to add, I would love to hear it, but also I'd love to hear from Jay um, what, what advice you might give to that decision maker who, who wants to make this move. I'm going to use it with another memorable analogy. Um, there's a term, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I see some decision makers, it's not even that, it's like bulldozing the, 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 the um, child care center into the river. Because everybody wants it to be everything. They want it to be home compostable, marine degradable, where right now, just focus on earth digestible. Because if you just focus on the materials have been certified separately, as truly compostable. So all of that long lead time work has been done. You don't have to worry about that work. You just know that, that you're putting your product in a package that absolutely is verifiably a food source for microorganisms. Then your, then your available material space is everything that's available. So if you need a high barrier package, you can do that easier if you're not demanding home compostability because in your mind, you want it to be home compostable because you don't know where the pack package is gonna end up. And in your mind, you think that's the best you can do. Well, no one can argue that a home compostable package will, isn't gonna break down faster in an industrial compost center, but you're missing the point. This is the first step in a journey to where we ultimately need to go. So right now you need a functional package that properly protects your product. So don't throw away good materials because in your mind, you think you need home compostable. There's great solutions out there. So start with a functional package that's earth digestible and then start stepping your way down to ultimately where you need to be. Jay, do you have anything to add? Oh, I feel my different worlds splitting me apart into different people, <laughs> different perspectives. My, my associated brain, my own personal thoughts are just kind of clashing right now. But um, yeah, so the thing is, I even have troubles just distinguishing what a regenerative package is right now. I, I can't tell the difference between what a sustainable package and a regenerative package is um, because I don't think there's either right now. Um, but I think it's, gosh, there's obviously, there's the gold standard right now for, for compostable that's available right now in Fujimura has it we've worked with them for over a decade um but again it's like we need to look at things that are accessible for everyone and um i i if i had a magic wand i would switch us all over to compostable but we have to be realistic with where we're at and it's the same with with energy like there's nuclear energy but that might get us over this hump there's hybrid vehicles that needs to get us over that hump right potentially um so yeah i think my my advice or my thoughts would be um for, for companies that are looking for regenerative packaging is to start just looking at what your motives are in the first place. Um, if it's 
if it's that you want to reduce GHG gases and that's the only thing, then you're, you're probably looking at only one of the one fragmented problem of climate change. Um, and I, yeah, it's, it's to me, you know, we start doing that, we start fragmenting things, you start having all this greenwashing, it's just, it's just horrible. So I would, I would, I would say start looking at, um, you know, how you can work with your packaging converter and their suppliers like Futamura on, on how you can, you know, create something new. Um, we, we need to try and try hard again. No one's going to be as unique as your company. Um, so we can't just imagine that here's this thing that we can do that's regenerative and here's a package that's going to work. It's, it's got to be very unique to you. Um, and yeah, and that's where maybe the time is to work around packaging. You know, around, I don't mean, I don't mean, I mean more like where, where's the inputs coming from? How can we, you know, regenerate those systems? Um, if we can't create this perfect package right now, then let's at least regenerate the forests that are we're using for pulp, but maybe look locally at your own pulp mills. That's what, that's what we have to do. Um, because, and Futamura and even us, we have our own kind of um, things that we have to keep hidden because those are a competitive advantage, but we have to work locally to, to see these things through. And um, for me, it's just working locally with, with people and trying to figure this out at a local scale. So just start doing that, get involved in different areas, ecosystems, getting involved with waste systems, get involved with all these things that you're, all the touch points of your package, get involved with that. That's all I can say. Don't take on like one thing like GHG emissions. Do, do look at the whole picture of your package. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. Look, look at all the inputs and all the end of life because you're not gonna hit a home run out of the gate, but you can, chances are you can make a big step towards making sure your package is earth digestible. And if you have a retailer that's demanding an unrealistic long-term shelf life expectation and that retailer is too big for your business to, to say no to, then again, you don't wanna throw out good material options because you think you need something that's gonna disintegrate in four weeks when it lands in off the side of the highway. You're not going to get that right away, but at least it's earth digestible. It's not going to turn into microparticles that persist for centuries. It's going to be earth digestible. Focus on that first and then let everything else catch up. That'd be my advice. I'd like to, yeah, and I'd like to kind of expand on, on that a little bit. I So we have a question in the chat that um, is, is pointing out that compostable items ending up in landfills still generate methane um, and that a lot of compostable items need to be in industrial composting facilities in order to break down. And so in your point of view, as, as we continue to talk about infrastructure and things on a more local level, does that mean that we need more industrial composting? Do you see it growing in prominence in response to, to this kind of shift to more compostable items? Composters are alive and well and they're profitable, but their margins aren't fat. A lot of them are sold out for six to nine months, so they're doing well. The, the, the challenge is, again, they don't sort stuff on the front end. So they need help. They need some of that $25 billion that the oil and gas industry gets to help address some of the challenges. And as weird as it is, um, you can't take packaging and sell your compost to organic farmers, which is ridiculous. So I think I saw something about GMO. The GMO part, look, th that again, we have to create some time. Like right now, there's, there's biopolymers out there that are, were designed to use plant-based feedstocks to create those polymers. Well, if that plant-based feedstock doesn't currently exist, you can't, you have to use synthetic feedstocks. So again, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. You gotta realize that at the end of the day, is that product a food source for microorganisms or is it not? And if it is, it doesn't matter if it goes in the landfill today. Today, we have to plug the holes. You gotta keep me from blowing the glitter into the crowd. That's what we have to do. Otherwise, that glitter has got to disappear on its own safely. If it can blow away, it needs to go away safely. And right now, it's, it's about what escapes collection. That's the problem. Because my estimate is we got 1.6 trillion units being dispersed into every corner of the world every year. And we can't even design packaging that stays in one piece. I usually have something here I can show you. When we open packages, it ends up in two pieces most of the time. So you just doubled that. Because now you have twice as many pieces to deal with. Like we haven't, we can't, we haven't even designed packaging to stay at least in one piece. 
to then try to recover it. So Jade, I, I wanna give you a chance to respond first, and then I'd like to talk a little bit more about uh, that packaging, the design side, and also um, how we're communicating to consumers the value of this type of packaging. Sure, um, yeah, just in response to kind of local systems. Um, and it's, it's something our industry and our company struggles with a lot is integrity um, of, you know, kind of our packaging and what you're saying it is. That's a huge problem in our industry. And there's lots of stuff that's out there that is just straight out incorrect or wrong. Um, so it's a lot of it is for our company is kind of calling these other companies out <laughs> um, about, you know, just, you know, saying, saying the wrong thing about what your, your composable package is. Um, and that re really has to be done because if we're talking about BPI certified composable packaging, um, we need to keep that integrity going. And if we can keep that integrity going, then that means that collection is, there's no integrity in collection. And now we're starting to see this in um, locally in Washington, Oregon State, where um, you know local governments are banning green waste or sorry PLA films and cellulose films uh, from curbside collection. Like that's a huge problem. <laughs> we're making all these strides um, in creating this perfect package, but we're still we can't even deal with that at a very basic level. Um, so yeah, and I'm, and I've even seen again you know, talk about like government regulations locally. Um, I just the other day had a, a green, I saw a green pla a bag, a plastic bag. I'm like, oh, sweet, this is compostable. And then I looked at it closer and it's just, it has this ink coloring and it's, it said all these green and plat, but it was just, it was just plastic and it was recycled plastic, but it was green. It's like, to me, that's already, you know, you're, you're messing with the integrity of, of compostable collection there, uh, which is horrible. So again, I think it comes down to, just making sure, you know, each company is, sticks with a very high level of integrity around compostability, because if you mess up on this, you're really not only messing up your own brand and your own brand integrity, but you're messing with the whole system that we're collectively trying to build here around integrity. Sure. Yeah, I think that it's, it, and both of you have talked a lot about incentivizing better behavior um, and industry solutions, which is sort of the carrot side of things. Um, but you know, to me, that sounds like very much a stick problem, right? That people who are not incentivized and under no circumstances would be incentivized to um, not mislead the consumer. Um, I'm, I'm wondering how we get out of that without um, some sort of punishment might be a little bit of a harsh word, but uh, I don't know how we incentivize our way out of that problem. Um, so I don't expect you to have an answer right off the bat, but just something to think about maybe as we go into our Q&A section, I wanna give everybody a chance to go into breakout rooms and um, discuss, come up with some questions, talk to each other a little bit, and then we'll come back in about, uh, let's say six minutes and um, we can have our Q&A session with uh, the panelists. Sound good? Sounds good. Great. So I was just saying, I hope that you all have had the chance to chat with each other a little bit, uh, to discuss some things that you found interesting about our panel so far, maybe came up with some good questions. Please feel free to put those questions in the chat, or you can raise your hand and I can call on you if you're feeling brave and want to uh, put your face out there for everyone to see. Um, I think we actually have some questions in the chat as well, but um, in our breakout room, I asked Kelly a question that I'm gonna ask him again because I thought his answer was really good and I want you all to be able to hear it. Um, so I was asking whether or not it would be possible if for whatever reason we were able to switch over to completely compostable materials today, um, every company bought into it uh, and we were all ready to go, would it be even possible? Can we produce enough compostable material in order to do that? You can't do it without paper because we simply cannot build, we need to build more biopolymer plants, but there's no way we can build them fast enough to transition the enormity of the market. And I'm talking just flexible packaging. The enormity of it is such that you couldn't do it without paper, but we can't continue to do it with paper the way paper is made. But you have to have paper. And, and the thing is, paper is a great material. It's a canvas to paint green chemistry on that does things 
we've never asked paper to do because we've always had the luxury of fossil plastics to do those things. So that's where the new materials age kind of comes into play that we are coming up with coatings and adhesives and things that do things that we've never tried to make before. And if you in incorporate paper, if you need to see the product, then you need to use Nature Flex because it's literally transparent paper. Um, but if, if otherwise, I mean, paper is going to be critical to the transition. It has to be. Great, thank you so much. Um, and we have a question for Jay um, in the chat, and this is from Jessica. She's wondering with the current infrastructure and collection streams available for flexible packaging, would recyclable store drop-off materials be your first choice versus bio-based or industrial compostable materials? Hmm. Well, if we're talking about, I guess, renewable, then I would have to go with compostable, but I'd, I'd probably, uh, industrial compost just because if you look at population densities a lot of people don't have time <laughs> or space for home compost so um, I guess my vote would be uh, industrial but uh, and even just for yeah I guess the recycle thing there's that, that burn it or energy bag that's going around too that I've heard about um, that's just bad um, <laughs> but even just for recycling of flexible packaging there's a, a pilot project going on here locally in Vancouver but um, even that, I think, um, for the multi-layer plastics, um, they're just there's only about I think eight percent is actually being recycled, and then the rest is going for um, for you know burned for energy. So um, yeah, again, look deeply into what it actually means to drop it off at the grocery store. Um, where is that going? Where is their collection? Is it you know we don't really know, right? So. <laughs> It's just, again, just fall, always follow up and know what the heck you're talking about if you're going to attach yourselves to some kind of idea like that. I, I would add something to, to that question if I could. Um, I think one of the next big issues in, in human uh, humans today is we're going to start to realize that, and we're seeing it, if you watch the commercials close enough, our gut biomes are failing. We're running at 30% of the gut biome we should have. So as that continues to happen, we're going to realize that it's because we're growing food in dirt with nitrogen sources that aren't natural. So compost is going to become critical to repairing our soil along with regenerative farming. So there's going to be a point where compost facilities are going to be critical to, to sustaining the population. So it's going to happen. It's going to become a necessary collection and redistribution to make it fully regenerative from the packaging site. Packaging is gonna follow food waste to composting. It should just be a tag along versus trying to clean it and sterilize it and turn it back into another package. Just let it travel with the food and become part of, of the mineralization that we need to take dirt back to soil. Amazing. Um, we have one more question from uh, Joao, whose breakout room was um, hoping to hear a little bit more about the role of localized, reusable, and reuse packaging, and how that compares to single-use packaging, um, even if it is biodegradable. I'm a big fan of it. I think if you can use a reusable grains, things that you can, you can do it that way, uh, we did that way in the early American history. I, I think it's a great way to do it. We got to, if you want to plug the holes in the boat, some of those holes, you got to really seal up. And one of the ways to seal them up is if you don't need the packaging, like I, one of my analogies, when we were kids, you bought eggs, you boiled eggs. Now we can buy them boiled. We can buy them peeled. We can even buy them sliced up next to some meat in a vacuum pack of tremendous amount of packaging. We can buy that. And no one's going to stop those brands from offering those elaborate packages. But consumers can drive choice. So I think reusable is absolutely a critical part of this. Absolutely. Yeah, for our company, um, we're trying to support, I guess, in circular economy with the reusable side. So for us, it'd be shrink films for the most part are washable labels. So in that process of washing, it can come off easily. Um, but yeah, the great, a great system and a great example of, again, like another, you know, we're not gonna have one silver bullet, we need different things. And that's a very, what could be a potentially local thing, unless we're again, talking nationally with the loop system. Um, the only thing is with the pandemic, if it's like some kind of like local uh, thing, it could maybe have some issues there with cleanliness. If it's if the system, again, doesn't have integrity for, to keep that going. So. 
Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely, um, if, again, if we had a magic wand and we could do all reusable, that would be great. Um, I was even thinking about just even for, you know, packaging our, if we start making, there's so many different constructions out there of packaging. Like it, it, you see a pouch, but you think, oh man, it's just a pouch, but it's not. There's like multiple types of pouches, multiple barriers, multiple um, reasons for that package. But if we can start maybe, you know, having fewer packaging types instead of all this complexity that might make it a lot easier or you know give value to MRFs if we can start you know just having a few types of pouches instead of like a thousand types of pouches or sizes and um, that could maybe be the future role for flexible packaging uh, yeah yeah so, I think like there, there's a lot of conversations that happen surrounding consumer confusion, but I think that also there's the buyer confusion who these uh, CPG companies who are probably very confused about what, and especially those decision makers who are trying to decide what is what is sustainable <laughs> packaging, what is regenerative packaging, but what what is an actual step toward making that happen for my company? And I guess to to bring it back to consumers a little bit, I think that I'd love to hear from you both how you communicate the value, um, whether it's to your customers or on more of a consumer and retail level, the value of sustainable packaging, because so much of value communication happens on pack, uh, but doesn't often talk that much about the packaging itself. Um, so I wonder if either of you have thoughts on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Gosh, it's hard when you're competing with your own marketing tools, um, especially if you have kind of like the fair trade, you know, imagery or, you know, all these certifications, you know, filling up the whole back of your package ingredients. And then you have to like kind of shove in somewhere, you know, some information about your packaging. Um, yeah, I think unless you use like a QR code, but I don't, I don't think I've ever used a QR code, to be honest, when I go to a grocery store to look at a package. I don't know if that would work, but that would be the only way to like kind of really expand the knowledge or augmented reality if you went to a grocery store. But again, I feel like these are not scalable or that people are actually interested. But um, <laughs> it, again, it just comes down to your, the story you tell and, and how your company make cho makes choices. Um, and people will, if they're kind of like loyal to your brand, they'll start to like just trust you. And, and there's a lot of examples of customers out there. One of our customers is Lush. Um, people just love what they're doing. Um, and they actually, their goal is to not deal with us anymore, which is kind of funny. Um, they want naked packaging. They don't want, um, you know, all these fancy packaging or things that look good anymore. They just want the basic packaging. So yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a tough one. Yeah, I think that that's where the, the package is a, a physical form of social media. And you don't have to have digital printing to do this either. You can use conventional printing, but you got to make the package be the interface to the story, to the information that you just don't have the real estate to put it on the pack. But I think the most important part that we don't, I think brands feel it. I know retailers feel it, but that underswell that's driving a lot of this change is the demographics of the consumer base. Younger generations don't buy bullshit <laughs> and they, they don't stop doing their homework. So the continuous strive to understand is forcing. So if you put something out that's not fully vetted or it's kind of misinformation, I think it's eventually it gets unrooted. So I think they're taking that uh, Gen Z and, the, and the, the generation behind it, they're taking them very, millennials and Gen Z, they're taking them very seriously and the one behind it that they're really looking for legitimate authenticity. And if you're not, they're going to find out. So I, I really think consumers are driving a lot of this. And branded litter. Nobody wants to be a part of being in the top 10 of every packaging wrapper found on any beach on any continent in the world. They don't want to be in that top 10. Yeah, Who absolutely. Yeah. Um, I wonder if there's something that makes you both um, hopeful about the future of packaging. Is there something, a product or a company or one of your own products that is making you feel inspired and, and like we're moving in the right direction? For me, it's entropy. I, I, entropy, I'm a chemical engineer, so I'm gonna use a technical term. It's the second law of thermodynamics. It's why you can't build a perfect engine. It's the natural tendency towards disorder or chaos. So 
no matter what kind of engine you build, it's not going to be perfect because you lose energy from frictional heat of the gases, right? So when you spew things out on every inch of every continent every single day, and we use five or six packs a day, the entropy of that cannot be solved by adding more entropy to it. So that entropy is going to force us to rethink it. Otherwise, we're not going to need packaging because we're not going to have packaged consumer goods. So I believe the existential reality of it is going to force this to happen regardless of what people wish they could do. They're going to have to go down a regenerative path. There's no other way. You can't support 7.8 billion people if you're not doing it regeneratively, which is the definition of sustainable, meaning I can do it forever. That's the only metric anybody needs. Can I do this forever? If no, how long can I? And what's wrong with doing it forever? And address those in time. Easy metric. Yeah, for me and I guess our company, I'm just in the evolution of my, of my role. Um, we've had compostable packaging for ages now. Um, we've just, we're just developing, a, uh, we, or we have developed, we're trying to get um, BPI certified. Um, a compostable lidding film like that's already goes onto a fiber tray, um, a single peel, and um, that technology is there. But the, the, the stuff that the, the problem with that is there's not much demand for it yet, so it's kind of like this big waiting game. Um, and then there's all the complexity everyone knows about with like regulations pick up. But the stuff that actually gets me going in terms of my role is actually working with customers um, in new ways that I've never even thought possible before. Um, that's kind of what drives my excitement and the things that you can change happen instantly. Again, with our customer Lush, um, there, there was never a system for, um, for, for label stock, the, the, the label liner, there's no real recycling. So there's actually, we've again, went to the mills directly um, to create a system. We just, just Lush, our Lush's buyer and myself and some other people on team. So getting all this and, and then their team, like getting these kind of projects going to create new systems that can then be scaled eventually. Um, that really is exciting. And there's huge opportunity there. If you know, if you're interested on the content side or the storytelling side, um, it's just working together. We need community to get through this. Um, if you think you can do this alone in your company or you're the sustainability person within your company, I, <laughs> we desperately need to do this in community. So I think, and, and, and it's kind of like those, those projects we can do on the, on the other sides of things or in, you know, where our company, or where our packaging ends up or where all the inputs are. There's all these little projects that we can start to scale up um, that we can start help each other in the natural foods industries or the beauty industry. There's, there's so many of them and like our company is super excited to do all those. So that's where kind of my excitement gets uh, generated from. Wow, thank you so much, both of you. And thank you for being a part of our regenerative community here at How Good. We really appreciate your time. Um, there were some questions, really great questions in the chat that we didn't quite have time to get to, um, but I will maybe try to put you guys in touch so that you can chat a little bit more. Um, and I look forward to seeing all of you at the next event, next Thursday, uh, same time, same place. Um, and thanks again, Kelly and Jay. Look forward to working with you more in the future on community events like this one. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.